So we are going live in three, two, one. We are live. We can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Asia Pacific Spine Society takes the pleasure in welcoming you all, delegates, for the fourth and final webinar program of 2022. Before we move on to the academic activities of APSS in 2023, this video program is going to be highlighting upon the surgical techniques in scoliosis and kyphosis surgery. And we have a star studded faculty members to bring forward the best in surgical techniques to you all the delegates. And I'm sure at the end of these 120 minutes, we are all going to go home enriched and learned people more than what we are today. Without taking much of your time, may I take this opportunity to welcome the APSS president elect Prof. Moon Kwan Kwan to please deliver the welcome address. Prof. Kwan, over to you. Okay, thanks, Vishal. Thanks, everyone. Uh, first of all, I welcome everyone here, especially the participant to this fourth APSS Medtronic webinar. So this is the fourth webinar of this year. Uh, previously, we have three other webinars, which were very successful. And at this point, uh, we're shown that this webinar was viewed by more than 1,000 viewers. So today's webinar is mainly designed to educate everyone on the surgical technique in regards of the scoliosis and kyphosis surgery. Uh, we have invited many senior experts from the Asia Pacific region to share their knowledge and more importantly, the surgical tips and tricks. So I'm very sure that you'll gather all this knowledge and put it in practice back home. <coughs> so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the online education committee Vishal and team, thank you very much for designing the excellent program. And lastly, uh, I would like to thank the, our sponsor, uh, Metronic, for supporting this great event. So everyone, relax and enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Kwan. I take this opportunity to also welcome the academic partners of APSS online outreach program. Medtronic has always been there to support the academic activities in Asia Pacific region. And I'm sure this mutually befitting association is going to go long forward in years to come, where we launch our another online programs to come forward. May I welcome the chairman and director of training and education for Medtronic Ms. Linda Su, to please deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. And thank you, APSS, for this honor and privilege to address all the distinguished faculties and guests in this virtual meeting. This is a four-part webinar series, as what uh, Prof. Dr. One has mentioned in partnering with APSS, not only a renowned society within APAC, but across the globe. No doubt the pandemic has brought a lot of face-to-face -face activities to a halt. But through the esteemed dedication of the board of members of APSS, they were able to look at opportunities on how to continue to extend learning opportunities to their members and audience across Asia, as, as a matter of fact, as far as the Americas, Middle East, and Europe. With a total of three virtual webinar sessions as that have concluded, and today is the final fourth series, there is an average of about 800 participants per session with a total combined of 2,500 spine surgeons that have actually viewed this webinar across different continents. And this indeed has been a remarkable and successful webinar series. And with that, we would like to especially thank the board of APSS. To start off, Dr. Rajesh Sekran, the honorary president of APSS. Uh, Prof. Dr. Kwan, the president-elect of APSS. Dr. Jose, honorary secretary. Dr. Ya, the honorary treasurer. Dr. Vishal, the chairperson of the webinar series and the chairman of APSS online subcommittee. And of course, uh, uh, Prof. Luke and Dr. Siva, our past uh, APSS past president and all distinguished faculties and moderators. We from Medtronic are privileged to be given this exclusive opportunity and to foster a collaboration with APSS with a shared common vision goal and to provide the best of education opportunities to all the esteemed surgeons and healthcare providers. And with the aim 
that we all want to have the best outcome and a positive impact to the life of the patients that we serve. With that, I would like to congratulate APSS again for a tremendous success for the webinar series and thank you for the partnership. Thank you, Linda, for wonderful words. And I'm sure this association in promoting the academics in Asia Pacific and across the continents is going to last longer in the coming years. Thank you, Linda, again. This being the final and the fourth webinar in the series of spinal deformity, where the first three discussed in detail about the principles and challenges, complications and salvage options in detail in the previous three webinars. All these webinars are also going to be stored and very soon available in archive format on APSS website. To all those who are non-members of APSS, I request all of you to become the life members of Asia Pacific Spine Society to avail all the benefits of members of APSS. This fourth webinar is about surgical techniques in scoliosis and kyphosis surgery with faculty from across the regions of Asia Pacific. We have a widespread faculty to bring forward all the common and rare and advanced techniques in scoliosis. To bring up the academic session, may I pass on the baton to Dr. Kaisau and Dr. Chikit to, to please moderate the session. Over to you, Dr. Chikit and Dr. Kaisau. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, the first uh, topic is uh, the release and the reduction of many of us in scoliosis. Uh, uh, let's well prove a look from Hong Kong. It, it's proof loop, it's here. Good afternoon. So I'm going to discuss on the release and reduction maneuvers in scoliosis. Before we go into the technical details, we have to revisit our goals in the surgical fusion. And that is to produce a fusion block which is parallel at the top and the bottom of a fusion mass without a shift in the coronal plane. In the sagittal plane, we have to address the appropriate sagittal profile according to the levels that we're going to fuse. The squaring of this fusion block is actually the key to achieving a global balance and avoiding the distal adding on phenomenon. This result has been published by us in uh, clinical orthopedics five years ago. So if you're interested, uh, please take a look at the uh, paper submitted. Now, and then how to achieve this uh, square fusion block? The three key issues to consider, one is the levels to be fused, which is less, uh, most importantly determined by the flexibility or the correctability of the curve. And then we can talk about the intraoperative surgical maneuvers. There are many ways to determine the flexibility or the correctability of the curve. Uh, this is usually done preoperatively uh, pre with a bending radiograph. And I personally uh, like the fulcrum bending um, radiograph that I developed back in the 1990s. Um, basically, we put a bolster under the apical rib with the patient awake and we'll determine the uh, flexibility or the correctability of the curve, which is very reproducible. And then on this radiograph, then we'll determine which are the levels to be should be that should be included to achieve a square fusion block without a shift or a parallel end plate. If the curve is very stiff, it can uh, and the correction is not satisfactory on the fulcrum bending, then we will consider different degrees of modification of the flexibility by doing uh, releases. And my indication is on the radio, uh, on the fulcrum bending radiograph, if there's a residual curve of more than 45 degrees, that would be an indication for some form of release. Releases can be done anteriorly or posteriorly. And posteriorly, there can be simple, multiple level uh, ponte osteotomy of the facet joints, excision of the rib heads, particular subtraction osteotomy, or if the curve is really rigid. Uh, then you may have to consider vertebral column resections. Of course, the more release you do, the higher is the risk. Back in the early 1990s, I started to do thoracoscopic anterior releases. And because of the deformity and the 
angle of inclination of the discs, you have to use multiple portals in order to get uh, parallel into the uh, the disc spaces. Like in this case, with the 76 degree curve, and on the fulcrum bending was only 41 degrees, and after a first stage thoracoscopic release, the flexibility went down to 28 degrees, and then followed by surgery, where we could achieve a similar degree of correction of 29 degrees at the end of the day. This method of preoperative assessment and uh, the use of focoscopic anterior release was actually published in uh, European Spine Journal in 2005. For this very large neglected curve uh, presenting late, the curve is very stiff and the anterior disc spaces are actually very narrow. Thoracoscopic release cannot be done. So we need open release of all the anterior longitudinal ligaments and the annulus. This is the intraoperative photo showing the trans thoracic retroperitoneal trans diaphragm approach to the thoracolumbar curve after doing a near complete um, annulectomy and a discectomy make sure that you also release the posterior longitudinal ligament which should be the last bit that will um, uh, make this curve stiff and after releasing at multiple levels you can either use anterior instrumentation to keep your reduction or keep your uh, uh, correction and then followed by a posterior long neutralizing uh, long fusion so in this case it was this 116 degrees bending to only 74 on fulcrum bending we did multiple level anterior release together with the anterior instrumentation and the second stage a posterior long neutralizing fusion for the posterior releases i suggest you read this AO surgery reference, which is a free app available uh, and something that I also contributed uh, to. So um, the first type of osteotomy is a posterior column osteotomy or the ponte osteotomy. Okay, what you do is actually removing the spinous process, the supra and the interspinous ligament, the articular facets, meaning the inferior articular facet of the one above and the superior articular facet of the uh, of the one below together with the ligamentum flavrum and the joint capsules and this can be easily done over multiple levels to achieve a more harmonious correction of the deformity so these are some of the intraoperative photos showing the clear uh, disposition of the uh, the bony anatomy identify the facet joints remove the distal half of the uh, lamina and spinous process, the ligamentum flavum, and then also the facet joints, all the way from one side to the other, uh, basically fr also freeing the, uh, the exiting roots. And after the multi-level uh, segmental uh, ponte osteopathy and the screw placement, then you do your rod contouring as we're going to discuss. So this is an example of an 80 degree curve on program bending was fifth, only 52 uh, with multiple level ponte osteotomy. We achieve a final correction down to 32 degrees. If the curve is really stiff and neglected, then most of the time, uh, simple posterior ponte osteotomies are not sufficient and you may have to do vertebral column resection. This is uh, uh, not a simple osteotomy. Uh, but rather a vertebral column excision, so we are not going to go into details of this. Now, the, then the instrumentation strategy, where are you going to place the screw and how? So it comes down to the point of screw density, screw placement strategy, and of course it, this, uh, the material stiffness has also an effect on how much correction you can get. We did a study on comparing the, the uh, screw placement strategy on alternate levels or on the what we call the key vertebral screw uh, strategy, more screws on concave side and neutralizing compression on the convex side is uh, uh, recommended by Dubuzet at the beginning. And then the uh, all segment um, screw placement. What we found that there's a, actually there's very little difference or even no difference between screw strategies for the flexible curves, but for the more stiffer curves or at least the stiffer segments of this of the of the same curve, you uh, the uh, consecutive multi-level screws 
uh, and uh, stiffer stainless steel implants can give you better correction. But of course, there's a cost implication if you, you put screws into every level. Now then we talk about the reduction maneuver. There are many ways to skin the cat. You can translate the spine to the straight rod. Uh, you can put the uh, rod on the, on the concave side first, on the convex side first, uh, or segmental derotation. But personally, I like the differential rod contouring system, uh, method, which is actually cheap and uh, or inexpensive rather, uh, because we are making use of the coupling uh, principle. Now, this has been described by White way back in the 1970s, that a scoliosis is a 3D deformity that we all know, and the three deformities in the three planes are actually coupled, that meaning they're linked together. So if you correct the deformity in one plane, the deformity in the other two planes will follow. We proved this in one of our experiments, showing there's a linear correlation between the cop angle and the apical vertebral rotation. And on the fulcrum bending radiograph, we can actually predict how much of the uh, apical derotation can be achieved simply by uh, correcting the coronal curve. The conclusion was that 82.7% uh, of the apical vertebral rotation will uh, correct spontaneously under the fulcrum bending. And then the surgical derotation maneuver uh, probably has uh, little additional effect, especially when you're talking about segmental correction, segmental derotation correction. So this is how I do it. I put in a concave rod first with a rod rotation and then put a differential rod contouring on the convex side. Now remember, rotating the rod is not the same as rotating the vertebral body. Because if you apply one force to a, uh, to a, a body or to an object, it will only translate. You need two forces in opposite directions to rotate or derotate the, the spine. So you look at this model, this is looking up the spine from the caudal end towards the cranial end. The caudal and the cranial neutral vertebra are not rotated. The apical vertebral body is maximally rotated. If you put in a concave rod first, and then you rotate the rod in a clockwise and the anti-clockwise direction, Basically, you're translating the apical vertebra, the, uh, the left side of the apical vertebra, dorsally and medially. Okay, so after you've done your rod rotation, the spine is still rotated. The vertebral body, apical vertebral body is still rotated until you push the convexity of the vertical body uh, anteriorly or downwards. Right, so this is what will happen if you push your second step, push the convexity down. So this is the steps of the correction. I contour a concave rod according to the, uh, the sagittal profile, load it on the concave side, but then after derotating it or rotating the rod by 90, degree, 90 degrees, after rotating at 90 degrees, the rod is in now in the sagittal plane. Lock the distal screw, so that the rod will not spin back, but keep these screws loose, right? Don't keep this, don't, don't lock the screw heads here. Turn your attention to the convex side, load the convex rod, which is under contoured, meaning that it is less kyphotic than, with, uh, than the concave side. Lock the cranial end, and then by pushing down at the distal end of the convex rod, you're pushing the apical vertebra anteriorly. Right, so looking at the spine from the side, this is the cranial end, caudal end, looking from the left, uh, after rotating the rod 90 degrees, lock the distal end, and then go towards the convex side. Now, this is looking at the spine from the right side, lock the cranial end first of this under contour rod, push the distal end of this convex rod down anteriorly, so that you push the apical vertebra down gradually. So this is the clinical photo showing exposure of the T1 to the L1. Do the alternate level pedicle screw uh, implantation. And then after implanting all the screws, do your facet fusion and excision. Contour the concave rod. 
put it in, lock the distal end after rotation, and then under contour the convex rod and compress on the convex side. Okay, starting from cranial, push down the caudal, and then compress intersegmentally on the convex side. Now, then you are now ready to come back to the concave side, do your final bit of distraction as the last step. As the last step. Okay, remember, don't lock the concave rods at the beginning, otherwise you, there's no, you, you cannot derotate the apical vertebrae with your differential contour. Finally, leave the two, you mobile, uh, use the two most distal screws to contour, to adjust your sagittal, uh, or, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the central sacral line by compressing or distracting, you're pushing this central sacral line left and right to ensure that your fusion block is actually uh, not listing. You can use a long T bar intraoperatively to make sure that the, uh, the spine is centered. And finally, don't forget to decorticate and do your fusion. The fusion is the most important part, not the screw insertion. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Th thanks, th thanks, uh, Prof. The Rook's uh, presentation. And uh, is there any uh, question from the audience? And uh, if that not, uh, I have a question uh, to uh, uh, Prof. Rook. And could you, uh, Prof. Rook, could you uh, share us uh, what your experience, uh, how to uh, keep the uh, source of kyphosis after correction. Is there any some uh, uh, details to uh, many uh, maneuver to uh, keep the kyphosis of uh, uh, the source spine after the uh, during the correction? Um, thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, many people say the thoracic pedicle screw fixation will cause a hypokyphosis. Uh, as you can see from my presentation, the kyphosis is mainly controlled by the concave rod. On the convex rod, if you do a differential correction, you actually you do flatten the spine. So on the concave side, you must ensure that this is the amount of convexity or the uh, uh, kyphosis that you have built in. Because when you do, when you do your concave rod uh, compression, you actually lose a little bit of the uh, built-in kyphosis. So make sure when you plan your concave rod contouring, you know the segment that you are going to fuse and therefore you have built in the amount of kyphosis appropriately. I, I don't know whether I've answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there's a question from the delegates. Uh, to Professor Liu, what, what's the role of double rod rotation? Does it give better reduction of scoliosis? Uh, in that case, can we do convex rod rotation first? Uh, there's no name for from this uh, text. Uh, I think uh, is an anonymous question. Yeah, I, I, I've actually done uh, both rods rotation at the same time. Now, if you are going to do that, then the curve has got to be fairly flexible to be able to do the double, or I mean, the simultaneous contouring of both rods. Um, the difficulty sometimes is because of the, uh, 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 the lordosis or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rotation. The apex of the vertebral body are at two different levels. So it would be easier. Uh, you, you, you can do it. Uh, if the curve is relatively flexible so that you can apply both rods uh, at the same time. It's actually easier to do it in the lumbar spine. Uh, in, the, in the lumbar spine, when you do your correction, the correction force is mainly from the convex rod. So you're basic, basically pushing the convexity, the lumbar hump anteriorly to restore a lordosis. Now, in those cases, then, then the, the, double, the rotating both rods together is actually slightly more uh, easy than in the thoracic curve. Uh, but I think, uh, like what I tried to explain in, in, the, in the presentation, uh, it's, uh, 
the whether you are doing one rod at a time or two rods at the same time, basically you are applying. You have to apply two forces to rotate or derotate uh, the apical vertebra. Um, so it's doable. In short, uh, rotating both rods at the same time uh, is doable, but that only works uh, if the curve is relatively flexible. So loading the rod onto the deformed spine uh, should not be too difficult. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Liu. Uh, so um, uh, I think the second question from the audience may be quite similar with the question uh, that uh, Dr. Kai Chow has asked just now. All right, uh, Professor Liu uh, has a yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great to uh, have the opportunity to to listen to Professor Luke. So you know, uh, me and uh, Jian Xiu it is still online. Uh, Jian Xiu, as uh, as nineteen ninety eight, uh, we we start and followed Professor Luke in in Hong Kong University. So it is my boss, great boy, has guided me. So yeah, thank you for for your great presentation. Uh, I have a question for for, for Professor Luke. Uh, you know, we have a lot of the techniques for for the correction of the deformity, especially in the pedagogical schools. Uh, you know, in China mainland, the people uh, the doctor prefer to use uh, pedagogical schools in each levels. Uh, this they believe they have much more uh, tools to correct the deformity. Uh, uh, you have mentioned. Actually, we have the strategies for for us to to use the pedagogical schools uh, according to uh, costing and the safety. So uh, we have uh, give, uh, given some suggestion. So is it uh, the density for the for the schools uh, is better? How 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 do we we can design that? I'm sorry. Yeah, as, as, uh, thank you, Professor Law. I think as I described in the presentation, uh, every, uh, putting screws in every segment would be useful for in the stiff part of the curve. Uh, so, and we all know in idiopathic scoliosis, usually the apical few segments in the apex, near the round the apex are the stiffer. The segments of further away from the, uh, the apex are relatively more flexible, right? So uh, in that sense, therefore, uh, if you find on the fulcrum bending, the apex, the apical segments are more stiff, then it's justifiable to put pedagogical screws in these segments, but not further beyond the apex. Say like if you have a thoracic curve from T5 to T12 or T12 to T11, usually the T12 L1 or the T11, 12 segments are relatively flexible. And you therefore don't need to put in screws in every segment in the lower part, right? So in that, in, I, I think if you use that principle, then you can see from the preoperative fulcrum bending, which are the segments that deserve more, uh, a higher density of screw placement. And also you can supplement your ponte osteotomy at the apex, at the apical segment. So basically, uh, you put uh, screws in every segment for the levels that you are going to planning to do a ponte. I mean, that would be a reasonable guideline. Uh, if the curve is so flexible, then you don't need to put screws in every segment. Uh, you are doubling or tripling the cost of the surgery because of the number of pedagogical screws that you are going to put in. So I think we just follow that principle and I mean, use your common sense. Where, is, uh, where do you need to put more screws? Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Professor Liu. Again, uh, we'll move on to the next presenter, who will be uh, Professor Wong chun Uh He will be presenting on direct vertebral rotation techniques in idiopathic uh, scoliosis. Thank you, Chikit. Uh, so we continue the uh, Professor Lo Zhuo Jing's uh, to raise this point that uh, we are many of us this afternoon are uh, mentored by Professor Keith Luke. So I hope uh, Professor Keith Luke will be pleased with uh, this deviation from his teaching that in, in the year 2000 on uh, the direct vertebral rotation in uh, posterior 
uh, idiopathic scoliosis uh, surgery. So, so just briefly talk about the pathoanatomy of AIS, which I think uh, we probably agree is uh, a relative anterior column overgrowth, resulting in the deformity in the coronal plane of a lateral curvature, uh, in the sagittal plane, uh, hypokyphosis, and also an hum, which is a vertebral body rotation in the uh, in the uh, in resulting in the rib hump, right? And if we believe this is the, the reason, then the larger the magnitude of the scoliotic deformity, then the bigger is the discrepancy between the anterior column and the posterior column height. So we are talking about axial plane deformity focusing this afternoon because we are talking about this aspect of the deformity correction in uh, posterior surgery. So again, I, I think most of us will agree that the patient present with axial plane deformity. Uh, most of the time, patient will present with the rib hump uh, and sometimes also breast asymmetry as the presenting complaint. Uh, they, they normally would not know they have a scoliosis until have a, after the aerodograph is being performed. So this concept of the apical vertebral displacement uh, is um, is important to how we want to correct this deformity in the three-dimensional plane. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the this is the, the 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 blue this this circle is the trunk of the patient uh, looking from the head end, and this is the midline, and this is where the apical vertebra should be if this person do not have uh, does not have a thoracic scoliosis, but with the uh, anterior column overgrowth during the adolescent growth spurs, uh, this deformity developed and the apical vertebra of the thoracic uh, deformity is now more ventral, more displaced to the right side usually, and also rotated in such a manner that the right posterior part of the rib cage is more prominent and the concave side or the left side is more recessed. So when we talk about uh, any deformity correction, we will have these three steps, right? I think uh, first we must have very strong and a uh, purchase anchorage on the bone. And then we will try if needed to, to increase the flexibility of the deformity. And then we will apply some maneuver to correct the deformity uh, usually in the plan or either in the vector of uh, how the deformity was formed in the first place. Uh, Professor Locke has uh, described and explained a lot about uh, flexibility enhancement. Uh, I would spend more time talking about uh, how we can further add on the decoupling effect of distraction to further reduce the rib harm in a patient with uh, thoracic AIS. So in terms of anchorage, this is what I would uh, normally perform. On the concave side, I would perform a segmental fixation. Um, and then on the convex side will be both ends uh, and also at the apex. Following which, uh, okay. Following which, then uh, a, a rod contour to be a hypo hypo hyperkyphotic to the thoracic spine, uh, but straight in the coronal plane is applied uh, through the on the concave side. So basically, I perform the concave rod reduction techniques. The three-dimensional plane uh, rod, the reduction technique are all achieved on insertion on this rod or most of them. Uh, whereas the convex side rod, uh, besides uh, Professor Luke's uh, idea of slight further derotating the apical vertebra uh, is mainly to add on to the stability of the reduction achieved through this convex side rod. So you can see that this is where most of the reduction is, right? This uh, 
are performed, the direct vertebral rotation or the derotation of the apical vertebra, the distraction on the concave side, because this will we, we correct the coronal plane deformity and also the hypokyphosis. And also when we were doing this, the gradual reduction technique will also translate, especially the apical vertebra towards the rod. And by, by doing so, uh, correcting the coronal plane deformity, the sagittal plane deformity, because this is a hyperkyphotic rod, and also uh, the, uh, the DVR also translate the vertebra somewhat because of the polyaxial pedicle screws being used. So I did a, a few cases of this uh, uh, case series just to show how much um, road rotation can help with correction of the deformity. So this, this is a patient uh, we performed surgery. We did a CT scan uh, before we correct the deformity. This is usually during the time when we uh, fit the CT scan, CT scan image to the uh, computer navigation. So that is one CT scan. And from there, this particular patient, the T9 is the apical vertebra and the LIV is the L1 in this particular patient. So basically looking at the difference in the rotation between these two vertebra gives us the idea of the rotational deformity of the scoliosis. So you can see the two pictures on the left extreme is before, before we attempt any correction of the deformity. The two uh, CT scan images in the middle are after we have rotated the rod, but we didn't perform any direct vertebral derotation. So basically just rotate the rod and distraction. We actually correct a bit of the rotational deformity from 24 degree in this particular patient to 21. But when we redo the whole deformity correction again with the rod and applying a direct vertebral rotation maneuver, we can further correct it down to 14 degrees. Well, it's still not zero, but I can uh, see that I, this particular case, the direct vertebral rotation further correct than what you achieve with the concave rot rotation alone. So in segmental derotation, uh, and you can see on the X-ray on the screen, the in this particular case where L1 is the LIV, so from between L1 to the apical vertebra, which is T9, it is towards the convexity. That means you want to rotate the vertebra in such a way that the convexity of the pedic uh, the pedicle screw on the convex side is pushed ventrally, whereas the pedicle screws on the concave side is uh, pulled backward uh, towards uh, the dorsal. In this way, we can uh, create a differential in the rotation between the apical vertebra and the LIV. Uh, knowing that the thoracic disc is not very mobile, so basically, I think if you look at the literature, we are only looking at one to one and a half degree per ro of rotation at each motion segment. So this is uh, how it is performed. This is actually performed through a device as, as such. This is both a persuader. And when you, when you apply this on both pedicle screws of the same vertebra uh, and, uh, and connect it across uh, like what you see on the picture on the right, then you will create a triangular construct anchor on both the pedicle screw tulip heads on the same vertebra. And by, by pulling the blue color handle, as you can see on the photo, you can actually uh, create a rotational effect directly on the vertebral uh, concern. Right. So this is even possible uh, with polyaxial screws. Right. With a monoaxial screw or some of these uniplanar pedicle screws, you can rotate the vertebra directly without this instrument. But this instrument allows us uh, the uh, 
the uh, ease of use of the polyaxial pedicle screw, and yet still enable us to directly rotate the vertebral body in the axial plane. So you can see here that this, this is really a lot of rotation possible between the apical vertebra and the LIV. So uh, actually, uh, like what uh, Professor Locke has mentioned earlier, the one of the criticism of direct vertebral rotation technique is by pushing the uh, the the hum forward, you might actually inadvertently reduce further reduce the thoracic kyphosis. So um, I prefer lifting the concave side uh, screws on this triangular DVR construct towards the dorsal. You can see here on this photo, I have a sterile bar and I tie the uh, triangular, con the DVR construct, the concave side of the triangle towards this bar and pulling it forward. So in this way, I can derotate the vertebral, especially the apical vertebral. And also I can facilitate the restoration of the normal physiological kyphosis of the patient. So this is what I mentioned earlier. This patient, uh, this paper from Kota, uh, showing that DVR result in hypokyphosis. And I think this is uh, again, uh, we have to go back to our understanding of the pattern anatomy. If the pattern anatomy of scoliosis is that the posterior column is relatively shorter than the anterior column. Now, by rotating this lengthened anterior column, which is now uh, displaced to the side, manifested as the apical vertebral rotation, now you actually have a way to derotate uh, the vertebral body, pushing it backwards into where it's supposed to be. But you are now worsening the uh, anterior column length like, overgrowth effect. So this will further uh, worsen the hypokyphosis. So to, to do that, um, we have to be very conscious to distract the posterior column. Uh, I quite commonly perform many levels posterior column osteotomy to release the posterior column so that more distraction is possible, especially in the bigger curve or in a slightly older patient. And also using a hyperkyphotic uh, concave rod, like what you see here. If we can use a 6.0 millimeter copper chrome rod bent to this, and we, many a time we will not have the deformity pulling and flattening the rod after we have applied all the reduction. And whereas if you use a strong, powerful rod like this, you will have uh, you you will have the ability to maintain or uh, restore more normal physiological kyphosis for the patient. And this is also one of the reasons why uh, we increase uh, screw density, the anchorage point, because uh, pulling a screw out by a stiff kyphotic rod is a possibility if we have not insert enough anchorage point. So this is uh, the same x-ray I showed you earlier. And here, besides the rotation, I added on the distraction from the apical downwards and then also upwards so that I increase as much as possible the posterior column length of this particular patient. And of course, distraction on the concavity is the, the maneuver to correct the coronal plane deformity. So after that, what I have achieved is something like this. And here uh, you, we can we can now apply the convex side rod, which is slightly less, um, less kyphotic than what you see on the patient after you have inserted the concave rod. So the convex side rod is slightly less kyphotic so that you have the effect of uh, pushing forward the apical uh, pedicle screw on the convex side, thereby further uh, helping with the rotational deformity correction of this particular case. So this is what you will see uh, fi finally. 
So this is one example of a patient. I performed this surgery and you can see that the thoracic kyphosis is very well uh, restored or improved in this particular patient. So in conclusion, I think to do any correction surgery, stable, adequate, anchorage, followed by uh, flexibility enhancement releases and appropriate correction maneuver is the key to uh, correction of the deformity. We need to distract the posterior column in NIS to rebalance the discrepancy in height or length, even on the convex side, but definitely on the concave side. DVR should be the first corrective maneuver ahead of scoliosis and also ahead of hypokyphotic uh, deformity correction. There are only a few motion segments to effect the rotational deformity correction that is between the apical vertebra and the LIV. And usually there are only about four to five motion segments to create this rotational deformity correction. Less kyphotic convex side rod, uh, like what Professor Luke has mentioned, to ensure no worsening or further enhancing the correction of the apical vertebral rotation. I thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any comment and questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wong, uh, for the very detailed uh, lecture. Um, is there any questions from the uh, audience? Uh, if there isn't any, I will start off with one question to Professor Wong. Uh, intraoperatively, how do you know uh, uh, you have achieved enough uh, derotation uh, de of the spine? Um, do you have any way to assess uh, uh, the derotation is enough uh, and you will stop uh, any more maneuvers of uh, uh, derotation further? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question, Chiki. Um, I, I, I don't. Usually, we just uh, visually looking, look at the apical vertebra. Uh, basically, um, we can correct, but we do not know how much we can correct because likewise, uh, in the coronal plane, we can do side bending or focal bending to assess uh, the flexibility, but in the axial plane, we do not have a way. Uh, but uh, most of the um, literature that talks about apical vertebral rotation, we correct about uh, 60%. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like eyeballing. Uh, again, it depends on how much you want to do. And usually, uh, if you can you can spend a lot of time trying to do a few rounds, just like distraction, you can do a few rounds uh, to, to correct further. Thank you. Thank you. I think Professor Young has a question. Uh, Professor Young. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, Cici and, Hi. and Q. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, what's your sequence? Because there are several maneuvers you're going to apply in this AIS correction. So, uh, for example, rock the rotation and uh, you, you say vertebral the rotation and but ethical vertebral translation and so on. What's your sequence to apply okay. the, all, all these maneuvers? Thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Yang. So, so basically, as I have mentioned uh, in one of my slides, there are three things I would need to do. Uh, they basically DBR, destruction, and translation. Right. So these these three, when you finally reduce the tubular head to the rod, which is hyperkyphotic, you will get that the 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 desired correction. Um, so actually, on top of that, there's still one more work I have to do is to hold that hyperkyphotic rod in position because I still the rod is still mobile in the in the whole. Uh, uh, the, 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 all the instrumentation. So, so the first, I need to make sure the rod is uh, in the appropriate uh, rotation. If I can, uh, in the in the plan, that means that it, it is uh, kyphotic. Then I would uh, I would start the derotation, the DVR. So basically, I I I correct using the the DVR instrumentation. Basically, first start on between the LIV, every segment upwards towards the apex, right? So as I tighten the first, the LIV nut, final tighten, and from then onward, 
is DVR, then distraction, move on to the next one and move to the next one until I reach the apex. And from the apex to the UIV is the opposite direction because now I want to make sure that I have not create any oh, rotational uh, deformity to the uh, UIV oh. or UIV plus uh, minus one or minus two. Thank you. I think um, I will allow uh, one more question uh, by Professor Wong Hiki. Yeah, the last question. Yeah. Hey, Chung Chek, thanks very much for your nice presentation. Uh, you know, you for me. many years now, I've been trying to understand, uh, you know, what DVR really truly does. Uh, I, I still have difficulty understanding it because in the end, the final determinant is the contour of the rod. You know, I mean, you cannot change the contour of the rod by DBR. So if you have, in concept, if you think that if you have an absolutely rigid rod, okay, then whatever maneuver you do, the final, fi final, final, the, the, the final common pathway is the, the spine will fit to the rod. Of course, you need to make the spine a bit less stiff, you know, uh, by releases, and you may have to put more implants, but finally, the, 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 the spine in concept will go to the rod. So whatever you do, uh, it's not going to make any difference. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, I, I agree 100% to this point. Um, but next time when you look at an x-ray, after you have corrected the deformity, Prof, uh, let's say uh, 80 or say 70 degree, you correct it down to 30 degree. And you look at the post op x ray, you will see that the apical vertebra actually is still lateral to your convex rod. No, no. I mean, whatever it is, the rod is not yeah. infinitely rigid. So, yeah, yeah, no, no, depending no, I'm, on I'm, the rigidity I'm... of the curve, the <laughs> rod will follow the spine somewhat. So, so, you know, everybody gives way a bit. The rod gives way a bit. The spine gives way a bit. But finally, it is mm. the contour of the rod that is there. So, 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 uh, you know, so your unless during your derotation the rod can shift and can move, or the rod can adjust to a better position. So the differential rod contouring concept, like what Professor Luke mentioned, I think you also uh, perform that technique. That means one side you try to use the rod to pull back the the, yeah, the yeah, vertebra, yeah. and the other side you want to push forward, right? So this is actually assuming that the vertebra is in between the two rods. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. So we can and capture it, but it for translation. It, but it is, it is not, because it actually is rotated out of this plane. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes you can actually use a hyperkyphotic rod. Even if the rod doesn't give way, you can pull the vertebra backwards toward the rod on the concave side, but yet the rotational deformity still stays because there's still not enough room in yeah. the anterior column. I actually, yeah. actually, I don't do it like he's, uh, you know, I, I don't do rod rotation. I do direct cantilever reduction. That means that I actually uh, put the rod already in the correct plane, you know, starting from the cephalate to caudal and I engage each one as a pool. So I get, direct, I get lateral translation. So I, I don't like, because I find that if I, Put the rod on the side and I rotate. It's like a lathe, you know. Yeah, the the, the yeah. rod gets strengthened. No, yeah, I don't do that. I, I use a very strong rod, uh, uh, and then uh, I I put it directly like this, and I use capture, and I use uh, you, mon, uh, uh, mono axial and uni axial screw so that the capture and the translation is very strong. Yeah. So, but, but I think that in the end. It is what the, the final rod uh, 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 contour will determine. I mean, this is um, something that uh, <laughs> I, I've been thinking about it for a long time, but thank, thanks very thank much you, for thank showing you, it. Thank you, thank you for... Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the next speaker is uh, Prof. Uh, Kit, Kit, Kit Wong from Singapore. His topic is MI surgery options and techniques in the scoliosis uh, a surgery.
Hello, friends and colleagues. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. As this is a video technique talk, I shall be focusing on the surgical technique and less so on the indications and pros and cons of the different procedures. MIS options in scoliosis surgery can be divided into anterior and posterior approaches. Anterior surgery is largely based on video-assisted thoracoscopic techniques. MIS posterior spinal fusions are seldom used today. It is based on muscle splitting percutaneous pedicle screw approaches. Because of the long segments involved in scoliosis surgery, percutaneous pedicle screw placements and facet fusions are both tedious and they are limited means of performing soft tissue releases and osteotomies and all these with increased radiation exposure. Video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or VATS has a unique advantage of providing multiple, ex multiple minimal access entry porters to a long segment of the spine in scoliosis, which would otherwise require double or triple thor thoracotomies if done open. VATS are typically used in the first stage anterior release for severe scoliosis and for anterior instrumented fusion for single thoracic and lumbar curves. In recent years, there is, new, there is a new application, which is non-fusion, motion-preserving anterior vertebral tethering. For this surgery, the, patients lie, the patient lies on the left side for a right-sided thoracic curve. The right lung is deflated and one lung ventilation is provided using the double lumen tube. Good lung deflation is essential for safe and trouble-free surgery. Thoracoscopic porters are based on alternate rib axis. Typically, the ports are centered over the third, fifth, seventh, and ninth ribs and are used to access the spine between T4 and L1. The entry porters are also placed to align with the apical vertebral rotation to avoid unsafe trajectories that intrude into the spinal canal. Pre incision, the image intensifier is used to determine the rotational alignment. This is the view through the thoracoscopic porters during first entry into the thoracic cavity. The rib heads, segmental vessels, and intervertebral discs are clearly shown. The lung will deflate fully over time. The spinal levels are determined using the most caudal rib head and the position of the diaphragm, counting the levels from distal to proximal, as you can see in this video. Access to L1 is obtained by detaching part of the diaphragm as shown above. The parietal pleura and segmental vessels are taken down using harmonic scalpel. And you can see the vessels being coagulated and then divided cleanly without charring, quite unlike the diathermy. The next video shows the takedown of the segmentals at the upper levels at T4 and T5. You can see the segmentals being coagulated and then divided very cleanly and without much charring. Discectomies are then performed. The vessels around the discs are coagulated. The disc is incised and removed as shown here. The cartilaginous end plate is separated from the bony end plate using a sharp cop elevator. In young patients in particular, the disc can be removed almost in one piece by this maneuver. Older patients will require osteotomy of the ring apophysis to release the end plate.
Note the flexibility at the end of the discectomy. And this process is repeated for all the discs in the segments to be fused. The vertebral screws are then placed under image intensifier control. The placement is immediately in front of the rib head in the upper segments and a bit of distance in front of the rib head at the lower segments, particularly at T11, T12. The aim is to place them at mid body level. The pilot holes are tapped and the screws are inserted in sequence. I like to, ins I'd like to insert them from the proximal to the distal levels, but the sequence doesn't quite matter. Interbody bone grafting is then performed through a bone funnel. These are morselized autogenous grafts from rib segments that were removed at the entry portals. A 5.5 millimeter cobalt chrome rod is measured to length and inserted through the distal, the most distal portal. Rod engagement sequence is from the proximal to the distal screws. You can see that the rod stands out from the distal screws as a result of the curvature. And the final maneuver is to correct the deformity uh, by engaging the rod into the ends of these screws by cantilever technique. So curve correction is achieved by pushing down the rod. In more rigid curves, standard persuader equipment can be used through the thoracic ports to engage the rod to the screws. Further curve correction is achieved through compression between the screws, starting from proximal to the distal direction, as shown here. This is the final view of the instrumentation in the chest. Pre and post operative x rays are shown here. And this photograph shows the chest incisions. Please note that there is no posterior midline scar and incisions are only on the side. Lanky 5 curve types can be treated using a hybrid thoracoscopic fusion above the diaphragm and a mini retroperitoneal lateral approach. The rod is placed through an incision at the base of the diaphragm. Lastly, I would like to speak briefly on anterior vertebral tethering, a non-fusion, growth-friendly, motion-preserving procedure, which has renewed interest in, in MIS anterior surgery. This is how it works. The tether is placed anteriorly in the vertebral bodies on the convex side, Curve correction can occur with sufficient growth potential on the untethered side. This early report shows curve straightening in an eight-year-old boy four years later. The procedure is performed through a minimal access thoracoscopic approach, just as in the fusion procedure described previously, except that there are no, dis no discectomies and no fusions are necessary. A polyethylene tether is inserted instead of a metal rod. These intraoperative radiographs show the implanted screws. The radiolucent tether cannot be seen. This patient is undergoing anterior vertebral tethering from T6 to T12. The patient lies on her left side. The right lung is deflated. I stand behind the patient. The most caudal rib head is identified as T12. The segmental vessels are taken down at mid body level using a harmonic scalpel. The screw entry point is perforated and tapped. Next, a bone staple is inserted, following which a screw of the appropriate length 
is inserted. Bicortical screw purchase is preferred. Screw insertion proceeds from the quarter to the cranial direction. Next, a polyethylene tether is inserted and fastened from cranial to quarter direction. Note the use of a tensioning device to tension the tether to achieve immediate correction of the curve. Tensioning is particularly important in more mature patients to achieve immediate curve correction as there may, there may be insufficient spinal growth left to effect correction by differential growth. The patient's post-operative progress is shown. Note the immediate curve correction due to tether tensioning and progressive correction of the thoracic curve is seen over the next 18 months due to differential spinal growth. Anterior vertebral tethering can also be before, performed for lumbar curves and double major curves. The following are the indications for anterior vertebral tethering. There are, however, challenges. Overcorrection has been observed in the very young patients and insufficient correction in the older patients. Tether breakage is common and may lead to loss of correction. Selection criteria still being defined. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Wong. And uh, is there any question? So uh, a question from myself. At, uh, could uh, could you share some uh, your idea about uh, how to select uh, the patient receive in the uh, AVBT surgery uh, and how to avoid the uh, the long term complication like uh, overcorrection? Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think um, patients uh, undergoing this surgery. Uh, are usually uh, either immature patients or uh, patients who have just, uh, you know, passed their uh, menarche, usually the perimenarche period. So if we were to do surgeries in these patients in, who are very immature, particularly when the triradiate cartilage is open, um, the risk of overcorrection is present. Once we have patients who have uh, closed triradiate cartilage, the risks are lower for overcorrection. But whatever it is, the signs of predicting correction is, is not great. So um, if we think that, so in patients who are very young uh, with open or non-fused triradiate cartilage, I would leave slack, slack in the tether. I wouldn't even tension it or it wouldn't even sort of uh, put any tension on it. But for the older patients where it is more likely to, to function as the internal brace, then um, correction is, uh, or tensioning of the tether to achieve immediate correction is, is there. The challenge actually is breakage. I think breakage rates are fairly high, 20 to 30% has been reported. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think that uh, it's not like a total failure because, you know, if we have a 10-year, 11-year-old girl, you know, who is not, who hasn't really gone into his growth spurt or just has just entered his growth spurt, if we can hold this curve, um, you know, for another two years or three years before final fusion, uh, we have already allowed a, a, a fairly good growth. And many of these patients didn't want to use the brace. I mean, you know, I mean, many patients, they just are not compliant with braces. I think this may be uh, uh, good for those patients. So just some question from the audience. And uh, a question is, uh, what uh, after breakage of uh, tether and uh, long-term, uh, long uh, that, that's uh, the audience, the audience means that uh, what, what it's a, uh, Okay, the, the I, procedures I, I after the breakage. 
yeah, I see two questions there. I'll answer the second one first. So, yeah. so when the tether breaks, uh, the curve will increase a little bit at first. So usually what I'll do is that I will observe it. For, for some patients who are skeletally, well into skeletal maturity, uh, the curve doesn't sort of progress, doesn't continue to progress, we'll just leave that alone. But for those who show progression, then I'll go on to either, this option is to change the tether, I do that for if the patient is very young, but uh, for the patients who are already skeletally mature, who are already skeletally mature, I would offer them fusion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just to add on uh, to that question, Prof, uh, is there yeah. any role of bracing them uh, if the tether breaks? I think in, I think that many of these patients uh, in the first place are very uh, non-compliant to, to 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 bracing, and uh, if they happen in thoracic curves, you know that uh, bracing is uh, not really very great for uh, thoracic curves. And where is the end point for for for? For bracing, of course. I mean, if the, when tether breaks and the curve is still thirty degrees, I mean, I'm not going to offer them fusion. But uh, if it goes on to 35, 40 degrees, and then go on further, I think I think these patients probably would do well with uh, fusion rather than putting another te tether and then worry about it breaking and so on. Yeah. I, so that's the first. If you, if you would allow me to answer the first question, uh, preoperative angio, no. Uh, if we do. Uh, 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 if we take down the vessels on only one side, there is little or no danger to the spinal cord. And there's been uh, a lot of papers have been published for thousands, thousands of cases where if it's just on one side, uh, 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 it, there, there's no uh, reported case. Although we do have uh, uh, anecdotal uh, uh, reports, you know, on, on people saying that, oh, I clipped the vessel, the signal changed and all that. But in, 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 for most of us who do anterior surgery uh, routinely, I mean, we have not seen that. Uh, so we don't do angio. So uh, uh, how to uh, control the ma magnitude of the uh, press during the tethering? Could you uh, tell, tell some experience? Uh, magnitude of? Uh, of the stress. Oh, or the stress. Yeah, it's actually yeah. more or less going to, um, we'll just usually, for if, if, if we want to do 10, in older patients, we just max the tension. But in very young patients, I would just place it there. So <laughs> like I said, there is no signs in, although we can measure the pressure, you can actually, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a marker for pressure, but uh, um, there is no equation or anything that, uh, Help with it, yes. Okay, Thank I you. think we may need to proceed to the next lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Wong, uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture. So uh, the next speaker will be uh, uh, Dr. Jan Sung Shin, who will be presenting on osteotomy for scoliosis, uh, hemivertebral resection. Okay, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, to invite me to Kevin here to present my technique on the field of sclerosis, especially congenital sclerosis. And the, I, today I was talking about the hemivertebral resection of a congenital scolio, kyphal sclerosis patients. Can we have my videos? Video, right? So the, the committee will give my video here or should I put a... Uh, Je Jennifer? Uh, yeah, you, uh, okay, uh, yeah, Jennifer, can you play the video, please? Yes, uh, this is a video to show osteotomy for uh, sclerosis patients. And usually, osteotomy for the vertebral or PSO is applied for kyphosis. Today, I will show a 29 years old patient have a congenital kyphosis sclerosis and uh, had a 64 degree kyphosis sclerosis at epic T9, T10. This video shows the patient. So, I will show you posterior hemivertebral resection of T10. 
as we under the general anesthesia, the patient was put on prone position and the middle line longitudinal incision was applied to exposure the spinal process and the lamina until the tip of transverse process. After that, make sure the fusion level and the pedicle screw was inserted by free handle technique. This is after put a pedicle screw below and now the upper thoracic and the thoracic area. Uh, I would prefer use the free handle technique to put the pedicle screws. After that, and we will exposure the transverse, transverse process and the rib head of the uh, T hemivertebra. So at this time, you must uh, take care of to remain subperiosteary and the extrapolar during this part, part of the exposure and uh, protect the intercostal neurovascular boundary. And uh, carefully, Dissect the parallel plural with the elevate uh, anteriorly to expose the anterior lateral aspect of the vertebral body. So it should be put my attention to the to the plural of the chest, especially when you're doing osteotomy above T12. and find the transverse process and use the pound to separate, the, protect the plural of the chest. And remove the soft tissue from the rib rib hand and the lamina completely. There's a corpus to separate the soft tissue. Because the patient had a congenital sclerosis, the lamina of T9 above and the below has fused to T9 and T11. So there's no space inter lamina space between them. So I have to use the ultrasound scapula to separate the lamina. Make a wedge si size, wedge shape cut of the lamina at this time to expose to the epidural. The ultrasound scapula make me easy to separate or dissect the lamina compared to the traditional osteotomy. I cut a wedge shaped lamina After remove the of the lamina, and just make sure there's no uh, unsegment bar between the convex side or concave side. So this the final cut of the concave side to mobilize the posterior of the spine lamina. Then I cut the. A uh, transverse process with the osteotomy, and uh, now use a sponge to protect the pallula.
I think that before the the video is going so fast, I before we doing into the uh, spine canal, and we must uh, cut. Yes, this time we need to cut the uh, rib hand about uh, two centimeter longer to further expose the the anteriorly to the vertebra. Uh, I use use osteotomy autumn and ultrasound scapula to cut the bone up and down and to exposure the until I get the the inferior plate growth plate of the above vertebra and the superior growth plate of the inferior vertebra to remove all the disc and the cartilage between two Vertebra. I would prefer to use autotomy to cut the end plate, like a Professor um, Kit Wong do the in from anteriorly. My assistant just protects the epidural from the middle side. Remove all the bony. I would prefer most cases. I would prefer to use the osteotomy because the bone up this kind of bone can be uh, applied for spine fusion. If we use the ultrasound scapula, the bone may be burned, uh, and uh, uh, is not good for fusion. So after completely remove the bone of the hemivertebra and uh, disc space. Uh, disc above or below. This is use ultrasound scapula to cut the the lateral side of the hemivertebra. So to completely free the vertebra, get mobilized of the spine. At this time, use the cancerous bone from the chemi vertebra, which I removed the first before to get bone graft at this period, at this space. But I would prefer use a short rod to compress the convex side by the two uh, pedicle screw first to get more, most of the correction. and uh, use another short rod on the concave side to, to destruct the uh, curve to get a further correction of the uh, sclerosis and kyphosis. The most uh, kyphosis correction was, comes from the compression of the short rod. And uh, use two another uh, standard rod to in the fused uh, area, so the, from above and to below, and then make a further instrumentation. Use multiple kind of rod has some benefit for this kind of patients. First, you can get a, um, more rod to stronger the, the rod. So in some cases, if you just use the two rod, there will be a curve, rod breakage during the follow-up time. So if we put more uh, rod on the epic, like uh, we said, a satellite rod may is helpful to reduce the implant failure. Yeah. The another adv advantage is if you cannot get fully correct of the spine deformity, because this patient had a wedge vertebra in T9 and T11. So this, this wedge, the, Vertebra will produce uh, some deformity, which I didn't uh, osteotomize them or collect them. So 
I use a longer rod to get a balance of the spine, which let me more easy to put the rod in, in the screw. And this time after compression, I rock the nuts. Further compress on the concave side, get the balanced spine, which collect the kyphosis or sclerosis. This is the post of patients. Thank you. Welcome question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shen. Yeah, it's a very uh, well-illustrated uh, surgery. Uh, is there any questions from the floor? Okay, uh, if there's no, uh, okay. Uh, I think Professor Wong raised his hand, yeah. Yes, Professor Chen, th thanks very much uh, yes. for a nice video. I like the, your harmonic scalp, your, your, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the, the blade, uh, ultrasonic blade, it's very nice. I just have a question on the segment that is fused. I know that uh, this is a technique video, uh, but usually how many segments, uh, you know, would you fuse, uh, you know, after in, in, in the hemiotypal resection? Uh, it's depend, depending on the curve. If there's only uh, typical hemivertebra, usually in a younger children, you know, be, be, for the age of five, I would prefer to use one screw above one, one segment above and uh, one below and uh, compress it totally to vertebra. If there is a big kyphosis, uh, as uh, uh, the bone is too soft, I would prefer to two above, two below. As for adults, they are usually have a sclerosis and a kyphosis. So it depends on how much curve of, of the sclerosis and of the kyphosis. Generally speaking, if the, the, the happy, happy, uh, hemivertebrae is on the posterior, it's just kyphosis, three vertebrae above, three vertebrae below is useful, or is, is enough. However, in some patients, like this patient have a severe sclerosis, so I would prefer to, uh, from the coronal balance review, I would prefer to use fuse this patient to from T5 to L2. This is my principle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a, some questions uh, from the audience from uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Diraj. Um, isn't fusion by posterior instrumentation with pedicle screw uh, is more challenging? and distracting on concave side after hemi resection signal loss has been observed, uh, which was reversed on compression of column. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, I think what he meant is, uh, is fusion more difficult by posterior instrumentation uh, and uh, the second question is uh, in a distraction on concave side after hemi resection, is it associated with uh, signal loss uh, during surgery? Uh, may I just ask the second question first? Uh, distraction from concave side is not easy. It is so rare to bring the spinal cord monitor change because you compress the uh, concave side, convex side first, the short the spine first, and uh, in under the shortening of the spine, you just uh, discharge from concave side. So there will be not produce the risk of spine cord injury. And as for the uh, pedicle screw uh, internal uh, implant uh, for the posterior pro approach. So I think that we still have much room to put bone graph from posterior. Uh, to get a stronger fusion with uh, more implant, uh, like pedicle screw from posterior. Yeah, there, I think there's a, a comment or a question by Dr. Srivasta Tava. Um, can there be overcrowding of neural structure after acute epical shortening 
Uh, and do you have notice any neurological deterioration after that? Uh, before you mm, close the wound, you must check the epidural above or below of the, your osteotomy to see if there's a bungling or buckle along at their, at their space. Also, you may need to check the spine code monitor and if everything is going smoothly and going well. So if all is normal, it's, you may satisfy with your correction and uh, have a good result. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Shen. Thank you uh, very much for Dr. Sun's uh, presentation. And uh, I think the next speaker is uh, Prof. Uh, Johari from India. And his uh, topic is growth rot and uh, what uh, for EOS. Welcome. Well, thank you and uh, greetings everyone on this webinar. Uh, I'm happy to be presenting in front of all of you spine surgeons. I'm a pediatric orthopedic pediatric spine surgeon. So I take you to a fascinating area of spine surgery you know, and that's early onset scoliosis and uh, the field of management of early onset scoliosis and uh, the use of growth sparing techniques, growth rods, why, when, how, and some tips and tricks. So early onset scoliosis with young spine, severe curves, our treatment options are limited. What do you do for a five and a half year old child with a progressive deformity he has a syndrome? He has a very high cob angle, both for kyphosis as well as for his scoliosis. So what do you, what do, you do you know, for in these cases? The aim of treatment would be to stop progression of the curve and to allow maximum axial skeleton growth. Lung and thoracic cage development should continue. You know, this is important for a number of reasons. Why should we spare growth? So significant amount of growth occurs even in the early ages, so in the first year is 12 centimeters. But as you go on, even between five and 11 years of age, 14 and a half centimeters of growth is present. And beyond the age of 11 to 15 years, 12 centimeters of growth is present. It's shown on the graph on your right side. Even. So a lot of growth is remaining and we should be trying to preserve this growth. Also, the lung cross-section, you know, this is based on the thoracic growth. If you restrict thoracic growth, the growth of the lung would be restricted and that can cause a problem with the quality of life later on. We know that the number of alveoli relates to the age and fast growth of the lung occurs in the earlier years. So we need to nurture growth of the thorax during this golden phase of lung growth. So early definitive spinal fusion is not recommended because it can cause restrictive lung disease. And of course, deformity can still progress despite localized fusions. The whole spine can actually curve and revision surgery would be required in about 40% of patients. So when do we do something for this child? You know, this child is of course already late with a severe deformity. We would like to tackle these children early. Progressive curve, more than 50 to 60 degrees. Child who's less than 10 years of age and failure of bracing or casting you know so we try conservative management when they fail one needs to resort to surgery and for a progressive curve more than 50 to 60 degrees of course we need to do something so how to intervene well a number of methods are there uh, distraction based of course you have traditional growth rods magic magnetic uh, growth expansion control and uh, vector and compression-based vertebral body and staple and tether that was mentioned recently, then growth guidance using the Sheila technique and the Luki trolley. So I'm going to focus for want of time on the traditional growth rods and on magic or the magnetic expansion. So here is a 10-year-old girl presenting with a juvenile scoliosis, which is increasing, going into the adolescent years. What do we do for her? So this is a traditional growth rod. This is a dual growth rod, which spans the area of the curve. And then number of distractions which are carried out. So this is a couple of years, two years after uh, the surgery, the fourth distraction, which is done every six monthly to get the maximum correction. The fifth distraction here, followed by the 
final surgery a year later you know so a year year and a half later the final surgery was done and this is the sort of correction we can get with this sort of surgery so this is the traditional growth rod dual rod well this has a number of disadvantages multiple hospital admissions which can become psychologically traumatizing multiple anesthesia and the morbidity associated with surgery so repeatedly six monthly anesthesia and it risks and uh, as we go on expanding the growth rod you know so called expansion of the growth rod larger forces are required every time we get less and less of elongation so this is called the law of diminishing returns so distraction the other issue is what is shown is bone formation so bone formation below the rod you can see that very very clearly in these pictures well this is very common autofusion is very very common with traditional growth rod so children treated with growth rod this is to the extent of 89% so this would require about many smith peterson osteotomies 7 to 8 smith peterson osteotomies would be required depending on the length of this fusion when you are doing the definitive procedure for this particular spine now an option to the traditional growth rod has been the magnet controlled growth rod or the mcgr this has a magnetic housing within the rod and uh, rod expansion can take place by means of a remotely controlled external uh, distraction uh, apparatus the remote controlled extens ex uh, external distraction apparatus uh, allows you to lengthen the rod periodically which can be done at whatever frequency you desire whether two monthly three monthly or four monthly this can be done and uh, the fixation anchors are similar to the traditional growth rod the actuator which is the central portion which houses the magnet is pretty long it's 9 cm long and then there is a area which is a non bendable area of about 5 mm above and below so virtually 10 cm of the rod is non bendable you know so what you have to bend is above and below to be able to fix this rod to the spine and this does become a issue the smaller rods are available with a 7 mm actuator which would mean that about 8 cm of the main area is not available for molding of any sort you know so there are fixation anchors then the rod then the actuator body or the distraction assembly and the rod below here is an example of a 10 year old with a curve angle of about 80 degrees she has a hemi vertebra actually thoracolumbar hemi vertebra but with marked deformity you know and the parents didn't want any sort of shortening procedure so we resorted to a growth rod elongation this is subcutaneous tunneling this is not subcutaneous but subfascial tunneling of the rod uh, passed from the upper end to the lower end through two small incisions the proximal anchors and the distal anchors and the rod in between and that's how it is fixed and then the rod is expanded by means of the distraction remote distraction this is after the sixth distraction one can see the opening of the magnet shown by the sieve like appearance uh, seen here that is opening of the magnet which is seen and further distraction virtually 3 years later this is the amount of distraction which remains constant you know as we go on lengthening it remains constant so beyond 3 years it seems difficult to get more distraction the parents were waiting for her studies as well they wanted the definitive surgery at the age of 18 so she finally has a definitive surgery at the age of 18 so how do these traditional growth rods compare with the magnetic controlled growth rods you know and um, there are differences of opinion uh, between different publication the curve correction seems similar the height increase seems to be better with the traditional growth rods the incidence of revision surgeries and more surgical procedures probably happen with the traditional growth rod the complication rate between the two seems to be similar though so the magnetic control growth rod versus the traditional growth rod the magnetic control growth rods are safe and effective in the treatment of progressive early onset scoliosis with the avoidance of repeated surgical lengthenings post generation reduces with the magnetic rod as the rod opens thus reducing the amount of distraction gained with the magnetic rod versus the traditional growth rods and the magnetic growth rods become 
virtually ineffective after three years of implantation and distraction. Metallosis is a concern with the magnetic rod, and hence it is recommended that these rods be removed at the end of growth with a definitive surgery. Complications of growth rods, rod breakage, can be based on the type of rod which is used. Single rod, the incidence was as high as 25 to 30%. With dual rods, the incidence fortunately is very low. Most series would have less than 5%. Anchor dislodgement, especially at the proximal level and proximal junctional kyphosis, uh, which the next speaker is going to speak about. Then deep infection, superficial and deep infection can be a concern. Metallosis with titanium beer debris, uh, especially with the magnetic rods. And then, of course, psychosocial complications. Now, growth rod graduates means when they come to skeletal maturity, what do you do? As I mentioned, the magnetic growth rod would require a definitive spine surgery with removal of the magnetic rods because of the metallosis problems. The traditional growth rods, some could be left on the follow up. There are areas of auto fusion, and if these areas are large, uh, definitive fusion may not be necessary. So, stiff spine and auto fusion areas may demand. Multiple posterior osteotomies if you're tackling them. But then if the scoliosis is not increasing and the rods are in place, you could leave a certain percentage of these cases alone. Maybe about 20% of these cases don't require a definitive surgery. Contraindications to the growth rod. Untreated spinal dysgraphism. Short, sharp curves are better tackled locally. Predominant kyphosis. Syndromic children who may have problems with the traditional growth rod and repeat surgeries, age less than three years, and those children who are poorly built and nourished. The personal tips for success with growth rods, proper patient and family selection, use dual rods rather than single rods, obtain solid foundations, particularly proximal thoracic, Subfacial or submuscular rod placement is better than the subcutaneous placement. Preoperative traction or casting can be used in rigid curves. Aggressive treatment of skin and wound problems. Lengthen rods every six months for maximum spine and lung growth. And exchange to standard dual rod segmental instrumentation for final fusion. So take home. Growth rods are useful for well-defined indications in patients with early onset scoliosis. They work on the principle of distraction. The traditional growth rod needs repeat surgeries, but can generate higher forces with less tissue reaction. The magnetic growth rod avoids repeat surgeries, however, may be ineffective in three years time, and metallosis is a concern. All growth rods are subject to the law of diminishing returns over time. So this is common to all growth rods. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to end the lecture here. Thank you. Thank you, Jahari. And uh, I, I think there is a question uh, it's to re regard with regarding to one of your cases you just presented. And uh, the question is why you use the uh, growing rods uh, so, uh, for a 10 year old patient with near skeletal maturity? Yes, I mentioned the reason for that, you know, when we discussed the options, you know, the parents didn't want any shortening surgery of the spine. You know. They wanted, in fact, they postponed even the definitive fusion till the age of 18, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't know the this sort of problem with the literate families, you know, in private practice. Some of them really want to do it the way they want to, the way they have gathered information. You know. And that was the reason. You know. So we could have done a resection and we could have straightened, you know, and that would have finished off everything, but they didn't uh, want any sort of shortening of the spine. That was the reason why this particular case I had to do it this way. But generally for all congenital scoliosis with hemivertebrae, we would resect them, you know, the junctional ones. Yeah, uh, Professor Asho, I have a question. Um, uh, you mentioned that you need to have a good foundation, especially at the proximal anchorage. So uh, can you tell us uh, how do you achieve a good uh, foundation uh, at the proximal uh, anchorage side? Yes, so basically I'm more used to the traditional hook system. So we use the transfer process hooks and the 
um, pedicle hooks, you know, but uh, generally we do it at two levels. So at least four implants are there. Uh, you can use pedicle screws and some papers recommend using six levels, uh, six uh, sort of implants, you know, three levels of fixation, uh, basically to have a good proximal. So we've done that occasionally, basically to have good um, proximal fixation, especially in cases of kyphosis. Thank you. So um, if there, there is no other questions, uh, thank you very much, much Professor Ashok. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to another, the next lecture. Uh, the next lecture will be presented by Professor Yang Shuhua on techniques for avoidance and management of PJK or PJF. Dear colleagues, I'm Su Hua Yong from Taiwan. My topic today is techniques for avoiding and managing proximal junctional failure. This is a 12-year-old girl with T12 hemivertebra and congenital kyphoscoriosis. Hemivertebra resection and posterior instrumentation fusion were performed to correct the deformity. In following years, progressive PJK was found and proximal junctional angle reached 15 degrees of kyphosis three years after surgery. This was a 13-year-old girl with lanky type 5C AIS. Posterior spinal fusion from T10 to L5 was performed in 1999. Rapid progression of PJK developed within six months after surgery. This was a 59-year-old female patient. Degenerative lumbar kyphoscoliosis and spinal stenosis developed a few years after previous L4-5 laminectomy. L2 to L5 instrumentation fusion and decompression were performed in 2008. Lumbar sagittal mar alignment was not well managed at that time. PJK slightly progressed in first two years after surgery. After loss follow-up for five years, she came back to my clinic with kyphoscoliosis and spinal stenosis at the proximal junctional area. Progression was clearly evident in following six months. This is a 65-year-old female patient she underwent two previous lumbar spinal surgery in the other hospital. Five months after the second surgery, a rapid progressive kyphosis developed at the proximal junction of the surgery. This talk will briefly introduce definition of proximal junctional kyphosis and proximal junctional failure, risk factors, prevention, and management. PJK is known as a development of minimally symptomatic kyphosis immediately above a spinal fusion construct. We have proposed a measurement for proximal junctional angle in 2003, which is shown on the left-hand side. The current popular measurement method is proposed by, by Dr. Gretus, published in 2005 which is shown on the right-hand side. PJK is usually a progressive pro process in early post-operative course. The prevalence is around 20 to 40% in a long segment instrumentation for spinal deformity. According to the etiology, PJK could be the results of disc and ligamentous failure, bone failure, and in imprint bone interface failure. Depending on location of UIV, PJK at sarcolumbar junction is more likely due to bone fracture, and PJK at upper thoracic spine is more likely due to soft tissue failure. In most studies, PJK is found to be well tolerated by patients and no effect on clinical outcomes. Revision surgery is usually not needed. However, PJK larger than 20 degree was found with inferences on self-image 
and PJK larger than 10 degrees whilst with higher rates of pain. Proximal junctional failure usually indicate a more severe PJK with structural failure. PJF must also define as a symptomatic PJK requiring any type of re revision surgery. Tied to development of PJK related to soft tissue failure was 6 to 27 months, and PJF related to bone failure was 1 to 5 months after previous surgery. Clinical significances of PJF include increased deformity, increased pain, greater risk of neurologic injury, and higher need for revision surgery, which typically requiring osteotomy and extension of instrumentation and fusion. Prevention of PJK or PJF is usually based on evidence regarding etiology or risk factors. Measures to prevent PJK or PJF is to amend modifiable risk factors. Risk factors for PJK or PJF including surgical, radiographic, and patient-specific factors. Potential prevention strategies is to amend modifiable risk factors. During surgical dissection at the upper end of the instrumentation construct, inter- and supraspinatus ligaments and supra-adjacent facet and facet capsules should be carefully preserved to avoid soft tissue failure at the proximal junctional area. In case of posterior ligamentous compress disruption happened during surgery, augmentation can be performed by using mesilin tape or cables. Studies showed change of proximal junctional angle and revision for a PJF was significantly lower in ligament augmentation group. However, the other studies showed hand-tensioned mesilin tape does not reduce the incidence of PJK at one year. Reduce rigidity at the proximal end of the instrumentation construct by using hooks leaving a carpal screw stress not engaging in two bone, or using transition rods to produce a soft landing of instrumentation. This 41-year-old male was a patient with stanky type 6 C scoliosis and sarcolumbar kyphosis developed a few years before surgery. Multiple PCO and posterior spinal fusion for sarcolumbar scoliosis was performed. A pair of transverse hooks were applied at UIV for prevention of PJK. To avoid excessive preload of imprints at the proximal end of the instrumentation construct, forcing undress control rods into screws at the proximal end of a long fusion construct should be avoided. For philoptic vertebral cement augmentation at UIV and UIV plus one, was introduced to reduce the risk of vertebral fractures at the proximal junction. However, the intervertebral disc between two cemented vertebra is at risk of reduced nutrition and accelerated disc degeneration. The loading mechanism is altered, then adjacent segment degeneration and spinal canal stenosis may be accelerated. There is also a greater risk of catastrophic failure at posterior carbon. This is a case report showing repeated adjacent segment problem after cement augmentation for URV and URV plus one after primary and two revision surgeries. Regarding the location of URV, evidences did not show differences in radiographic and clinical outcomes or prevalence of revision surgery. UIV at lower thoracic spine has higher risk of adjacent vertebral fracture, and UIV at upper thoracic spine has increased risk of junctional kyphosis due to posterior ligamentous disruption. Fusion is advised to include levels with posterior junctional angle larger than 5 or 10 degrees of kyphosis. Threatening of thoracic kyphosis indicates a compensation for decreased lordosis at lumbar spine 
or increased kyphosis located distally. Fusion to upper thoracic region may not be needed in these situations. Otherwise, spinal fusion should extend to upper thoracic spine. These patients with lumbar kyphosis and decreased thoracic kyphosis were treated with three-column osteotomy and spinal instrumentation fusion stopped at upper lumbar or lower thoracic region. After correction of lumbar lordosis, spontaneous restoration of thoracic kyphosis were evident in the unfused thoracic region. There are several guidelines for optimal sagittal alignment. Ideal spinal pelvic radiographic parameters were found generally increase with age for management of symptomatic PJK or PJF, extension of instrumentation and fusion to upper spinal segments is usually needed. If spinal osteotomy is considered for correction of PJK or PJF, osteotomy could be performed in the proximal junctional area in case there is a bone failure at this area. When PJK or PJF is associated with flareback problem, osteotomy at the fused segment may be needed. Let's get back to the cases shown in the beginning of this talk. PJK in this patient caused no clinical symptoms or cosmetic concern. She is under follow-up and no treatment is given. Due to rapid progression of PJK, this patient received extension of spinal instrumentation and fusion to the upper spinal segments. In this patient, we perform simulation to decide location and magnitude of PSO for desired correction. PSO was performed at L3 and spinal fusion was extended to T9 and pelvis. This slide shows the sagittal profile before surgery, simulation, and after surgery. The final correction reached the goal design before surgery. A disc bone osteotomy was performed at the proximal junctional area to correct the sharp angular kyphosis in this patient. In summary, prevention of PJK or PJF is usually based on evidence regarding etiology or risk factors. Methods to prevent PJK or PJF is to amend modifiable risk factors. Prevention is always the best way of treatment. For management of symptomatic PJK or PJF, extension of instrumentation and fusion to upper segments is usually needed. Spinal osteotomy may be needed in certain situations. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. I think um, let us uh, move on to the questions. Uh, I see that there is one question from Professor Dr. Diraj again. Um, he, I think he asks uh, regarding how is PJK in pediatric deformity different from elderly? deformities, uh, maybe in terms of the risk factor and in terms of uh, the management? Yeah. Yeah, um, from the literature, there are more differences from adult deformity, you know, the PJK or PJF after adult deformity. The pediatric patients, I, um, personally, I don't have a lot of uh, pediatric patients with PJ plasma junctional problem, but I, I think uh, all those risk factors I mentioned uh, in, in my talk, uh, some of them are relevant to also to pediatric patients like soft tissue uh, uh, factors, uh, the uh, proximal anchors and the, um, uh, the uh, proximal uh, junctional angle above the UIV. I, I think those factors are still relevant to the uh, pediatric patients. Uh, the, the, those bony uh, factors may be just relevant to the, uh, the, all the alignment, uh, sagittal alignment, uh, uh, questions are more relevant to adult patients. That's um, my um, thought at this moment. Thank you. 
Um, I have a question. Um, do, do you uh, have any uh, regime uh, in terms of back care uh, and muscle strengthening uh, regimes uh, to uh, avoid uh, stress to the proximal junction? And uh, because uh, all this uh, risk factor of a BGK may not be solely due to implant and the anatomical factors alone, it may be largely uh, uh, affected by the patient's physical post-op physical uh, function and motion and activities? You know, for adult patients, uh, I, 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 I always instruct my patients to strengthen their bare muscles. It's not just for the uh, PC, PC, plasma junctional factors. And, but for the pediatric patients, it's very difficult to say if the muscle strengthening is uh, beneficial for, to, to prevent the plasma junctional problem. Of the, as you know, there are lots of uh, AIS surgical patients of young females. They are reluctant to obey the uh, instruction of mu uh, uh, muscles, muscle training, but not so many patients. Maybe just in, in my practice, just a, a couple cases I, I already showed you because um, there's not so many pediatric or adolescent patients uh, has the problem of plasma junctional uh, kyphosis in my practice. Okay. Um, do you, uh, one more question, uh, Prof. Young, uh, do you use any form of brace, uh, especially for adult deformity patients uh, post-operatively uh, to prevent uh, early onset of this PJK and PJF? Uh, I always use uh, total contact brace, circle lumbar sacrum, or sources of Boston brace not just because to uh, protect the uh, instrument and bony structure, but also to uh, you know, force the patient to maintain a good posture. And I instruct the patient to do in-brace exercise, in-brace isometric uh, muscle strengthening, like uh, six weeks after surgery. And uh, depends on what, uh, how, how extend the uh, bony procedure is. If the patient just have a, sim a simple PCO or instrumentation fusion, maybe the protection just for three months. If the osteotomy is as large as like uh, PVCR, maybe six to 12 months uh, is necessary. It uh, depends on uh, how fast the fusion can be achieved. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Yang. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no more questions, we forward to the next uh, next topic uh, presented by uh, Dr. Chabra from India. The topic is uh, 3D printing navigation robotics safety in the future in scoliosis surgery. I want to thank all concerned for uh, this opportunity to present uh, uh, in front of this August gathering. Um, I will be presenting on 3D printing, navigation and robotics, safety and future in school research surgery. Um, for 3D printing applications, we'll be discussing mainly deformities today. Uh, there are three different techniques, fuse deposition modeling, selective laser synerting, and sterolithography each with its own features, advantages, disadvantages, uh, and a different technology. In a nutshell, FDM is faster and more economical, whereas SLS and SLA are more accurate and allow using of materials which are autoclave. You can see how this model looks. Uh, the potential applications of 3D printing in spine include creation of patient-specific models for educational or preoperative planning purposes, creation of patient-specific jigs or guides to optimize instrumentation placement, creation of instrumentation or implants to fit a patient-specific or goal-specific need, and optimization of structure of off-the-shelf implants. So we talked about osteotomy guides, which can be used for performing osteotomies like a PSO. The primary goal of navigation is to optimize the surgical intervention by providing the surgeon with advanced visualization of the operative field and to see the exact position of the handheld instrument in relation to the bony anatomy. It allows the surgeon to access intraoperatively real-time three-dimensional and virtual images of the spine in relation to surgical instruments. 
It's a combination of image acquisition and processing that is followed by intraoperative navigation. So the advantages are accurate and safe instrumentation, minimal radiation exposure, reduction of surgical duration and reduction of surgical fatigue. The parts of a spine navigation system include image acquisition and processing unit and a referencing system. The image acquisition and processing unit uh, 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 is used. The first step is spinal navigation. in spinal navigation is to acquire high resolution images of the region of interest preoperatively or intraoperatively. The reference system includes a dynamic reference frame or array, light emitting diodes and a tracking system. The dynamic reference array is usually fixed to fixed anatomical landmarks uh, such as the spinous process. The preoperative image is taken along with the fixed DRA which serves to synchronize between the virtual navigated images and anatomical navigation system. DRA has provisions for attaching three or more spheres known as light emitting diodes. These LEDs emit light which is tracked by an electro-optical camera and are known as active arrays. Specialized surgical instruments can also be used which also have LEDs attached to them and are called passive arrays. The 3D orientation between these active and passive LEDs thus facilitates navigation. Uh, for a tracking system, it's generally optimal tracking systems which are most commonly used. They use infrared camera devices to actively track the light emitted or reflect from the LEDs which are attached to the DRA and surgical instruments. They provide real time three dimensional positioning positional data of the handheld surgical instruments in relation to the surgical fields. The process of establish, establishing the synchronization between virtual images and real anatomy is called registration and is of three types, paired point registration, surface matching and automatic registration. You can see the steps of screw insertion with the navigation system. Uh, accuracy, operative time and radiation safety are the advantages whereas wobbling and motion related artifacts are the main concerns which are there. Robotics is a marriage of image guidance with effector arm technology. It uh, uh, has the benefits of improved implant accuracy, minimally invasive, allowing minimally invasive surgery, reducing the x-ray dosage, reducing complication rate and early identification of special anatomical cases. We are presenting a case of a 16-year-old female with a painless kyphoscoliotic deformity with a difficulty in lying supine over the bed and difficulty in walking. <coughs> so this was a post-tubercular uh, kyph kyphoscoliotic deformity. Uh, the patient is generally positioned on Allen or Mackey radiolescent tuber, uh, table. And the major uh, and the robo is mounted on the side rails of the table and the stealth navigation system on the head end of the patient. This allows for seamless cone beam CT during the surgery and a multimodal neuro monitoring is generally done. The robo and the patient generally act as one unit once the robo is fixed on the patient with a PSI spin or a uh, pin or spinal clamp. Uh, the robo then defines a safe area for its movement, capturing the three-dimensional spatial orientation via optical cameras. Uh, then a snapshot tracker uh, is uh, applied for robotic or navigation registration. Uh, using the navigated probe, we mark a bony landmark as close to the area of interest as possible. Then the star tracker you can see is connected, which would aid in intraoperative phone beam CT or OAM scan. Once the CT is done, the images are transferred. There is confirmation of star marker. We mark the area of vertebra, uh, vertebrae by the robotic system, which has to be improvised manually. Uh, the lines are to be registered in the independent disk spaces. The vertebrae are marked and labeled. Manual correction of the axis is important, especially in cases of deformity in all the three planes. Once the axis is corrected, we could proceed with the planning of the trajectory of the pedicle screw. The system allows choosing different types and sizes of implants and even normal or reduction screws. 
planning should be done such that we try to avoid skiving potential which is slipping off the drill causing error in the trajectory once the screws are uh, planned in the desired trajectory they are stacked and uh, uh, sub millimetric uh, cuts uh, to confirm any error in planning of the screw and this should be checked in all the three planes per se whether uh, uh, coronal axial or sagittal per se the medialization has to be appropriate uh, so that skiving does not uh, take place uh, per se so uh, this is uh, this planning is very important and uh, needs to be done uh, such that you have the appropriate trajectory of the pedicle screws and we confirm it in all the so we smoothen the surface also to reduce the skiving uh, potential um, then the robo is directed to the desired pedicle per se uh, you can see the robo is being directed to the t12 pedicle screw cannula is inserted uh, the navigation probe confirms the direction of the pedicle screw the inner sleeve is inserted uh, it uh, and the sharp teeth are hammered so that it uh, do, does not move saline should be added within the sleeve to be drill inside so that there are no thermal injuries per se uh, the high speed drill is also navigated as you can see here and uh, we can have a live feed to confirm the trajectory tra trajectory in which we are drilling the real time navigation um, uh, helps uh, in uh, um, confirming that we are in the right direction one should always sound and check the integrity of the walls once confirmed we then tap directly or insert the screw and you can also see that under navigation. So on one side, the rod has been inserted and we are proceeding with the osteotomy. Uh, we can uh, use the osteotome, osteotome or uh, we can use also the bar. Using the osteotome helps in that we can preserve uh, the bone and use it for grafting. The cord should be always protected. Uh, uh, to minimize any injury to the cord. The bar is also navigated so we can uh, uh, use uh, 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 the navigation to plan the osteotomy as you can uh, uh, see here uh, to mark the pre-decided angles of the osteotomy and uh, to cut accordingly. So after we have done the osteotomy one from one side then we put the rod remove uh, put the rod on this side remove it from the other side and complete the osteotomy from the other side and all done under uh, uh, neuro monitoring at uh, continuous neuro monitoring which should be multimodal per se we insert after completing the carpectomy we insert the rod on the other side uh, after putting in bone graft anteriorly compress and correct both the scoliosis and the kyphosis deformity we could achieve a bone on bone uh, correction and thus uh, we did not need to put in a cage there uh, siam subsequently showed a good correction of the deformity in the ap and lateral views the neuro monitoring was intact uh, for this patient uh, the uh, after the correction from both the sides, the bone, you, we can see on the CM, uh, the correction of uh, the deformity. The bone bed was prepared by shingling for better fusion and surgical wound closure was done in layers. Uh, so this, uh, you can see what the clinical images and the radiographical images with correction. Uh, we have a good experience on deformity correction using the robo system and there is ample literature to guide the safety of the instrumentation um, will the robo replace the human being in the future that looks more like a fic fiction but there are plenty of advances which are taking place and we should 
expect them in the future. So all these three, 3D printing, navigation and robotics are very useful tools uh, for the surgeon. Um, there is good evidence that robotic assisted spine surgeon is more accurate, surgery is more accurate, more efficient and safer um, compared to either fluoroscopic or navigation. And uh, uh, the, there is no significant learning curve. Um, with the evolving technology, future generations of robots have immense potential to improve spine surgery for both patients and providers alike. So what we witness today may be the building steps to the definition of routine spine surgery in the future. For the best use of technology, the surgeon and robo both need to understand each other interchangeably. If one has not started, let's do that now before it is too late. Thank you for your... Thank you. Thank you for the presentation by Dr. Uh, uh, Chabra. And uh, I think there is a question from the audience. Uh, the, the, the question is... Uh, yeah, I can see the uh, question. When you... Were you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you can see the question. So, um, uh, Dr. Dheeraj is asking that he has started with CT-based navigation but has found errors in entry and uh, landmark mismatch. Uh, so, he has asked what could be the possible reasons uh, in this regard. <clears throat> Say, um, a lot depends on how you place the DRA. Uh, how far is it from the area of interest and whether the DRA moves in between, then everything would get affected. So you have to keep that into consideration. The other aspect is um, if it is a young child with good respiratory excursion and if you are doing it in the thoracic spine, that motion artifact can come in. And then skiving potential is always there also, and these all need to be taken into consideration. So in general, if we are working on a deformity, you keep uh, the DRA at the apex of the deformity and work above and below. Uh, no um, uh, uh, work area should be more than three levels or so from the DRA. And avoid that it avoid that uh, 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 during the surgery. If the DRA uh, uh, you touch it, if it moves, then uh, you need to register again in this regard. Otherwise, there will be artifacts per se. Also, if you are doing percutaneous, <clears throat> and if uh, the entry point is such that the drill skives, that will also lead to a mismatch. So in the robotic, uh, it gives an alarm if there is uh, too much medial angulation or if uh, uh, the skiving takes place. And uh, this helps also, but we have to plan uh, such that we reduce the skiving potential. And as we mentioned, if we also bar the entry point such that it is level, then the chances of skiving reduce. I hope I've been able to answer your question satisfactorily. Thank you. And, and uh, according, you just mentioned the, the percutaneous technique. Uh, uh, could you find that there's some uh, uh, complications uh, related with uh, soft tissue when you uh, perform the uh, percutaneous uh, technique? Very true. Um, uh, if uh, there is too much soft tissue pressure, the chances of skiving increase. So that's why uh, you need to plan such that um, you have do not have a lot of uh, soft tissue uh, pressure due to the angulation of the screw. And uh, that also raises an alarm within the robotic system and you can see a triangle there. Um, so uh, if uh, the skiving potential due to the percutaneous, uh, due to the soft tissue stress increases. Yeah, this one, uh, Prof. Chabra, but this one short question. You mentioned yeah. that uh, skiving is an issue. Uh, so how do you detect the skiving if it happens uh, during the surgery? Um, if it is an uh, open procedure, then you can see your uh, uh, drill or this 
uh, getting uh, shifted from the position where uh, it is uh, actually targeted. So you have to be aware about that and you have to correct it then. Um, that 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 mainly being aware about it and uh, is more important but more important is to plan such that you have uh, 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 you don't have an angulated entry point which increases the uh, skiving potential so you can bar it or nibble it to make it level and you should not have too much of a lateral angulation per se all right thank you very much uh, prof chabra um, I will proceed. Uh, we will proceed with uh, our last uh, last uh, lecture of the day. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Kartik Kalish uh, on anterior surgery in deformity correction. Thank you at the outset, uh, APSS, and uh, uh, nice to meet my old friends and uh, uh, and my uh, friends CC and Professor Mongi Kit. Okay, so my promise is to briefly run you through with the uh, with the anterior deformity. My, I don't have any disclosures to make. Uh, start off with the uh, a brief uh, story about a fourteen-year-old girl who had a progressive deformity for four years. She's found to have an all cure malformation. She underwent surgery for that. And she's found to have no neurovascular deficit. She came in with a 75 degree curve, a thoracic lumbar curve, and a compensatory curve of 40 degrees. So this is a clinical picture which showed her list as well as her uh, decompensation at that point in time. Following this, we went and did an anterior surgery, which is maintained across. And this is a under correction, which helped us in maintaining a balance, we brought it down to about 35 degrees. Following that, she maintained it. And a five-year post-op shows that the curve is well-maintained and she's got a very good uh, clinical, uh, good result for us. Next, we go on to another girl who is 17 years old, five years braced, normal milestones, and she had a 60-degree curve. Again, Tarakulambar, immediate post-op in 2001. We'll talk about the problems of this a little later. And 18 years post-op, she's found to have no significant decomposition, although she's although we are shot by one level in this, she still managed to hang on at the same level and has a reasonably good result, as you can see from her clinical pictures. Now, what are the indications for doing anterior surgery? Mainly, it's for spinal growth arrest. Secondly, for gaining flexibility when deformity is stiff. Better fusion rates and neuromuscular scoliosis. Spinal fusion and posterior structures are deficient. To stabilize spinal kyphosis prevent crankshafting, and of course, as used as an adjunct when you have a very, very stiff curve like this. This is a 17-year-old with a normal neurology who had a 120-degree, 115-degree curve, who was treated with an anterior release, anterior fusion at the apex, and went on to have a structurally good result even 17 years after surgery. So what are the techniques we use in doing this? I'm going to just take you through the presentation and then use a video to go ahead with this. So usually it's done in the lateral decubitus or lateral position with the uh, convex side up. I usually use a, a pillow or a sheet to augment the thing and break down the uh, uh, table to get, obtain more exposure. And there's a brief picture which shows the positioning. You can see that the, that the approach to the convex side and uh, we also go ahead and mark out the rib to be exercised, usually it's about the 10th rib, which we uh, uh, take down. Uh, you can use it with experience. You can go on to an extra plural retropatronal approach, which would be useful and avoid more mobility. Now, having done that, you then go ahead with the skin exposure and We take down the rib. There are certain surgeons who do, do not take down the rib on a routine basis, but I prefer to take down the rib because it gives me an opportunity to use a graft and provides the bed for my graft also. As you can see, it's been marked and then divided.
following following the relaxation, you have an option then to go on the uh, extrapural approach. Once you have done that, then you go on to a retroperitoneal exposure. The key here is to split the costal margin. The costal margin is taken down and at the 10th, 11th or 12th ribs, the costal margin is taken down, gives you a direct exposure into the uh, retroperitoneal space. And using this, if you go, if you undermine that area, you could actually go uh, extra plural and you do not have to do uh, a thoracotomy also along with that to reach the upper levels. So it gives us a, a little bit less of morbidity as compared to it. And also the diaphragm need be taken down in terms of doing this procedure. So as you can see there, the diaphragm burn. And following this, the next step, we go on into identifying the segmental vessels and we go on into ligating them or we can do an anti-release. In the earlier days, we used to put these clamps in to then wait for the neural monitor to pick up results. We had a couple of cases where the neural monitor went down. And, but now, of course, we're doing, as what Professor Wongi Kid mentioned, unilateral ligation, and these don't cause any serious problems for us. So video now to show the uh, demonstration. You take down the uh, vessels right in the middle of the vertebral body so that there's no damage done across. Once this is done, then you do a, a, a complete release. The disc is completely released. And the most important thing when you're doing the anterior release and discectomy is you take down the posterior aspect. And that is a key towards obtaining a good correction of deformity. It's, it's preferable that one ligates these vessels rather than, than, than uh, diathermizing or cottering them as it uh, prevents uh, leakage and then subsequently you have to redo them again. As you can see, the discs are completely uh, denuded and end plates are curated and once these are done at multiple levels throughout the thing, you have a complete release, as you can see. The key to this here is to do a thorough, thorough end plate curettage and obtain a complete release. Most importantly, the posterior aspect to remove the posterior tether. So as you can see for the picture, the next step would be the application of the staples, going on to the insertion of the screws, and a video again to show that the key again on this the insertion of staples, it can be either a unilateral fixation or it can be a bilateral screws. The, the, the screw insertion is typically done from the apex at to the posterior aspect onwards going towards the anterior. One doesn't want to fix the screws more anteriorly and is always directed posterior to anterior, 10 to 15 degrees towards the anterior aspect. And it's, it's done in a gradual form so that you could get a harmonizing lordosis created. Following this, the rods are then entered in. And the most important thing to do there is the compression and the reduction maneuvers thereafter. So once the rods are in, a serial compression and segmental correction is obtained. 
the graphs in the uh, disk spaces are filled with bone graphs. Sometimes you can even fill in with a, a mesh cage or a lordotic cage to obtain the lordosis across. So in general, anterior instrumentation saves levels. It achieves better correction, avoids decomposition, king two curves, decreased junction clauses, fixations every level, and of course, the decreased bed loss and literature supports improved fusion rates. Meta-analysis also shows that anterior instrumentation saves levels and obtains good correction over a period of time. Now, there are problems involved in all these procedures. One is difficult and exacting. You need a surgeon along with you to help it. You need pain, pulmonary dysfunction can be there, injury to thoracic ducts, as well as to blood loss, fluid molecular imbalance, GI complications, infections are, are known to happen. Neurological problems are serious, as done by the study before. It's important to identify the high-risk cases like short arch kyphosis, congenital kyphosis, etc. And of course, one has to be wary about retrograde ejaculation in all these patients. Surgical failures are known. Biological failures could be pseudarthrosis, stress rises, or spinal imbalance due to failure to include structural curves. One of these examples here where I showed you before that I should have gone one level below. I did not go at that level. But of course, fortunately, the patient uh, compensated and is doing well. Kyphogenic potential is noted in these cases, as you can see in this. Of course, take home N, uh, the pearls, N vertebrae to N vertebrae must be fused. Include all segments in the curve. Derotation is the main key. Posterior to anchor, anchor points of the screws and never compromise on the release. It's exacting surgery. Never hesitate in access help. Do not be over ambitious in correcting it. And remember, once ligation is done, it can't be redone. It's important to know what to do, but it's equally important to know what not to do. And thank you for the uh, opportunity given for us. Um, thank you, Professor Kailash. Yeah. So uh, is there any questions from the floor? Uh, if, if there isn't any, I will... Okay, there is one. Um, I think from the chat group, I just uh, read out what uh, Professor Dr. Dirash has written. With Pontis, only connections between vertebra is this and ligaments. These are elastic and move in all directions with modern instrumentation techniques. Any role of anterior release in the present era? Yeah, I, I think there is definitely a, still a role for uh, anterior release. The reason why people are not talking about doing anti-release is lack of exposure and the, and the non-availability of the so-called access surgeons or lack of training in that. If one is trained, I think people like us, we belong to a little older group. We were trained completely in the anterior surgery. And so anti-release is probably much easier for us than doing an all posterior surgery. All right. Um, I would like to ask, um, what is the, uh, com I mean, uh, the anterior approach has uh, its potential complication. What would you think that is the uh, what, uh, complication that is common, commonest that will happen? And what is the most fearful complication for this approach? The, the, most, uh, the most common complication we see is the, uh, sim the sympathetic reflex, which has been taken down. You know, you have, you have uh, unequal periods of warmth or feeling of heat in one of the legs due to the sympathetic and parasympathetic chain disruption. And that's the commonest thing which you have to explain preoperatively to the family because uh, that's very disturbing and worrying. The worst thing which can happen is a neurological disaster. You tie down the segmental vessels and then suddenly you find out that you do have a disruption and you find neurologically, the curve is beautifully corrected, but you have a neurological disaster. That's the most significant disaster you can think. And it can't be redone by, unlike in posterior surgery, where you can undo the uh, distraction and you know loosen the curves. Here, it's, once it's done, it's done. You can't do it back. So thank you. I think if there's no questions, uh, we will uh, thank, thank you very much for the, for the lecture and the presentation. So, um, so I will move on to end this session. I think uh, we have a long day. 
So uh, first of all, uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Vishal has an urgent matter to attend. So I will uh, represent him to close uh, by uh, thanking, first of all, all our, all our faculty members, uh, Professor Keith Lu, uh, Professor Wong Chung Jack, Professor Wong Ki Kit, Professor uh, Jen Xiong Sheng, Professor Ashok Johari, Professor Yang Xu Hua, uh, Professor Chabra, and Professor Katik Kalesh. So thank you very much for your time and effort, uh, in, uh, your lectures and presentation in this uh, webinar. Uh, we also would like to thank all the audience uh, and the participants that you have uh, spared your Sunday to join us in this webinar. Um, we also like to thank the EPSS Secretariat who had been working very hard to organize this webinar. Um, we also like to thank Auto TV who uh, had helped us in uh, broadcasting this webinar to uh, delegates around the world. And last but not least, uh, we would like to thank our industry sponsors, Medtronic, for your uh, support for, to organize this webinar. So in summary, I think uh, we have a very uh, diverse and but very de detailed discussion on uh, many surgical techniques in deformity surgery. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, all of you benefit from this webinar and uh, would get something back to bring back to your own practice. Okay. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to end this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, Jennifer and uh, Kaylin, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it went on uh, pretty well. Overall, um, have we stopped recording and uh, broadcasting? Already?